This is the day the Lord has made. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, that, this music makes me want to preach. Yeah. Oh. God is good. All the time. Let me get an amen. Oh, if he's done anything for you. I, I, let me stop. Man. I'm not the preacher this morning, so um, but I can. We can we can go in. But uh, we do have we do have a speaker this morning, and uh, it's a friend of mine. Uh, his name's name's Mark Charles, and uh, he is a writer, a speaker, uh, activist, and um, uh, uh, you are going to 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 love his presentation this morning. Uh, he is married, has three children, uh, lives in D.C. now, uh, went to school in UCLA. Uh, and then uh, one of the significant things about him is he brings a native perspective to, uh, to history and to some of the things that we talk around justice. And uh, I am, I'm, I'm excited for what's going to happen this morning through him. Uh, he lived uh, in the Hogan for 10 years after going to, LC, going to UCLA, moving back to where uh, he uh, was born as on Navajo Reservation, uh, and uh, yeah, just I, I, I could go on and on about him. I love him to death, and uh, welcome Mark Charles. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yat a, yat a. Mark Charles in the Sin beke to nan the slit, the tohiglin bashes chain, sin beke to nan bashes che, do to the cheat ni bashanella. The Navajo culture is a matrilineal culture and we identify ourselves by our clan. So my mother's mother, which um, is my first clan, is actually American of Dutch heritage. And so I say sin beke to nan, which literally means the wooden shoe people. My father's mother, my second clan, is tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bike Dine. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, which is the Bitterwater clan, one of the original clans of the Navajo tribe. I want to talk to you today about uh, a piece of history that most of you have never heard of. And I have to warn you, we have, A, we have a ton of information to go through in the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm basically going to deconstruct your last 12 to 16 years of education. Um, and you can't get a refund, unfortunately. But uh, what I'm going to say is going to make some of you angry. It's going to revitalize some of you. It's going to change your perception of what you think our country and our church is about. And you're probably going to have a ton of questions. So I want to get through this as quickly as we can. But uh, I just have to warn you, I need you to stay engaged in this. Because there's going to be parts of this presentation that are going to challenge most likely every single one of you in the room. So invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and convert them to his and their use and profit. These are the words of Pope Nicholas V in a papal bull written in 1452. This papal bull, along with others written between 1452 and 1493, collectively became known as the Doctrine of Discovery. The doctrine of discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by Christian rulers, those people are less than human and the land's yours for the taking. This was literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the African people. They weren't human. This is also the doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in a new world inhabited by millions and claim to have discovered it because there were no people here. If you think about it, you cannot discover lands that are already inhabited. That's known as stealing or conquering. If you don't believe me, put your cell phones out, and I'll come by and discover them for you. <laughs> the notion that America was discovered is a racist colonial concept that assumes the dehumanization of people of color. What this does is this makes the doctrine of discovery a systemically racist document. In 1763, King George drew a line down the Appalachian Mountains and wrote a proclamation. In this proclamation, he basically said that the colonists no longer have the right of discovery 
of all of the Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonists, so they wrote a letter of protest a few years later. In this letter, they accused the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. And they went on in this letter to say he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages. They signed this letter on July 4, 1776. Thirty lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Making it very clear the only reason they use the term all men is because they have a very narrow definition of who was and who was not human. What this does is makes the Declaration of Independence a systemically racist document that assumes the dehumanization of people of color. A few years later, the colonies wrote down another word, another uh, document, they started this document by saying, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Of course, this is the preamble to the Constitution. However, Article 1, Section 2, just a few lines below those words, when they are determining who is going to be included and excluded from this grand experiment, they determine that they're going to get to the numbers by adding the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service, and excluding Indians not taxed, and three-fifths of all other persons. They never mention women. They specifically exclude natives, and they count African people as three-fifths of a person. Who was the Constitution written to protect? White landowning males. Now, maybe you're thinking, wait, didn't we correct that? Yes, about 100 years later, we passed the 14th Amendment, which extended the right of citizenship to anyone born on this continent under the jurisdiction of the government. However, this did not give women the right to vote. They didn't get that until 1910 with women's suffrage. This did not give natives the right of citizenship. That didn't come until 1924. So it did extend the right of citizenship to former male slaves, but it excluded huge groups of people yet. And we forget that was, it was in 1970 that the same amendment, the 14th Amendment, was one of the amendments reinterpreted in Roe versus Wade, which now determined unborn babies aren't human and therefore they can be aborted. What this demonstrates is that the heart of our Constitution is not a value for life, but a practice of dehumanization and a value for exploitation and profit. What this does is makes the U.S. Constitution a systemically racist document. How did I get there already? A systemically racist document that assumes the dominant has the authority or the ability to determine who is and who is not human. In 1823, there was a Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. Two men of European descent in litigation over a piece of land. One bought the land from a native tribe, the other bought it from the government. They want to know who owned it. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court reviews the case, and they had to determine the principle upon which land titles were based. And they decided that the principle was that discovery gave title to the government by whose subject or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which title might be consummated by possession. They went on to state that essentially natives only had the right of occupancy to the land, while Europeans had the right of discovery to the land and therefore the true title to it. The legal instrument they referenced was the doctrine of discovery. This created a Supreme Court case precedent for land titles that gets referenced by the Supreme Court as recently as 2005. What this means is the United States Supreme Court is a systemically racist court that has legal precedent based on the dehumanization of people of color. I want you to think about the 19th century <clears throat> of our country, particularly the years 1819 to 1920. We often think of this year, these years, the 19th century, as um, there was some conflict. We had the Mexican-American War. We had the war of uh, the First World War was during this time. We had the Civil War. Um, but we often think of this time as our period of expansion. We were moving further west and we were expanding the boundaries of the nation. I did some research and found that from 1775 to 2016, every year in blue is the years that our nation was either in a declared state of war or armed military conflict against another entity. 
I then looked and said, what years were we in war against native peoples? And this is what I found. So if you look from 1920 to, or 1820 to 1919, that 100 year period, we were in a continual state of war against native peoples or armed military conflict against native peoples. These are the list of some of the wars, or the wars that were fought during that period. So what we refer to as a century of expansion technically was a century of ethnic cleansing and genocide as settlers move further west, even out here to Oregon. So we have a bunch of buried history that happened during this period. We had in 1830 the Indian Removal Act. This was an act of Congress that gave the government, um, in practice, military or the right to use force to remove tribes from their lands in the east to empty lands further in the west. This directly resulted in the Trail of Tears for the Cherokee, the Long Walk for the Navajo, all told, about a dozen tribes experienced forced relocations and marches, and tens of thousands of people died as a result of these relocations. In 1862, the day after Christmas, the largest mass execution in the history of our nation took place. 38 Dakota warriors who had surrendered, surrendered to the U.S. Army after a period of some skirmishes and, and battles were hung in a, lot, in a mass execution the day after Christmas, as literally hundreds of Christians sang hymns and cheered during their hanging. This hanging was ordered by President Abraham Lincoln. In 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre. About 150 to 200 Cheyenne and Arapaho tribesmen and women and children were encamped over a hillside in northern Colorado. They were waving a white flag of surrender and a U.S. flag to show they were there peacefully, an army came over the hill and slaughtered them in a single day. Later, their genitalia were actually paraded down the streets of Denver. In 1879, our, our Congress passed the Indian Boarding School Act. This was an act that gave the, the government and churches the ability to take children, native children, out of their homes and raise them in military-style boarding schools that were being established around the country. The first school was Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The stated goal of the school was to kill the Indian to save the man. Children were punished for speaking their languages. They were punished for practicing their culture. Many of these um, uh, schools had jails where students were housed. Um, and these schools remained in operation until as late as 1970 and 1980. In 1890, we have the massacre at Wounded Knee. This is a little more famous battle. 350 Lakota warriors were massacred in a single day at Wounded Knee. What we don't talk about is that 20 Congressional Medals of Honor were given away to the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers who participated in this massacre. To date, every effort to have these medals rescinded has failed. On December 19, 2009, Congress passed House Resolution 3326, the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. This was a 67-page bill laying out the budget for the DOD for 2010. Page 45, subsection 8113 is titled, Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What follows is a seven bullet point apology. It mentions no specific tribe, no specific treaty, and no specific injustice. It basically said you had some nice land, our citizens didn't take it very politely, let's just call it our land and steward it all together. And it ended with a disclaimer, stating nothing in this section is legally binding. To date, this apology has not been announced, read, or publicized by the White House or by Congress. So what do we do with this history? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. As a church, as Christians, what do we do with this history? The scriptures give us actually a very good tool to deal with deep systemic injustice and oppression and violence, and that's the tool of lament. A good friend of mine, Sung Chan Ra, has written a book called A Prophetic Lament. And in this book, he identifies one of the components of lament is that like being at a funeral dirge, where there's a body in the casket, it's not coming back to life, and all you can do is weep. All you can do is mourn over it. I think the church in America needs to enter into a season of lament over its complicity in this history. We wrote the Doctrine of Discovery. We've been complicit in it for 500 years. 
We need to lament it. However, if you're really going to lament something, you want to have some kind of light, something at the end of the tunnel, something that says it's going to get better. You're not always going to be sitting in it. And the problem is, is if I tell the church to lament its sin of discovery, genocide, ethnic cleansing, slavery, mass incarceration, Jim Crow laws, internment camps, nuclear bombings, most of our church is going to look and find their hope in the book of Second Chronicles which says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and what? Heal their land. We forget that this is a reiteration of the land covenant with the people of Israel at the dedication of the temple. The United States of America is not God's chosen people. This is not your promised land. There is no covenant in Scripture that says if the church in America confesses its sin, that God is going to heal your land. But why do we think that? Why do we believe we have, we share in this covenant with Israel? Well, we think that, we have to go back to understand our history of Christendom. So in the first century, we have the church and the empire completely separate. You become a member of the church through your discipleship, through confession, through baptism, through your community. When you become a member of the church, you know that you're standing in opposition to empire. Most likely you're going to be persecuted and probably even killed for joining the church. In the fourth century, Constantine becomes emperor of Rome and Christianizes Rome. Now if you read the teachings of Jesus and the letters of Paul, you will realize there is no such thing as a Christian empire. Jesus said his goal, his kingdom, was not of this earth. Paul was not here to make everyone Jews and create this Christian empire. The idea of a Christian empire is completely extra-biblical. But Constantine established one and dealt nearly a fatal blow to the church, fundamentally changing what it meant to be a member of the church. Because now, instead of joining the church through discipleship, confession, baptism, and community, now you join the church through your citizenship in the empire. This created a problem because now we have things the founders of the church never imagined, which is the members of the church are out fighting the battles of the empire. A plain text reading of scripture doesn't allow that. So we need Augustine to come in in the 5th century and begin doing some theological gymnastics. Creating a just war theory to justify why our young male members of the church can go out and fight the battles of the empire. This becomes the Crusades of the 11th century, which was about both expanding the empire and protecting Jerusalem. And then in the, the 13th century, the church begins defining a new category of others, which they called infidels, primarily referring to the Muslim Moors or indigenous peoples who worshipped other gods. What this does is now this justifies wars by the Christian empire, not even on a just war theory, but on theological grounds. We're fighting the other. This otherness becomes explicit in the doctrine of discovery in the 15th century. Initially, the Protestant church pushed back against the idea of the doctrine of discovery. But in the 16th century, or 17th century, in 1630, John Winthrop was sitting in the Boston Harbor about ready to go and colonize this new land. And he preached a sermon called The Model of Christian Charity. This is a sermon where he takes the image that Jesus used in his parables of a city on a hill and he applies that to the colonists. That we must consider that we shall be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. He goes on in his sermon to exhort them that together in all gentleness, patience, and liberality, we rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. We keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. These are actually not bad exhortations. But at the end of his sermon, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is the section where the people of Israel are standing at the banks of the Jordan, about ready to go take possession of their promised land, and God is reiterating the, the terms of the land covenant with them. If you obey me, I will do this for you. If you disobey me, I will do that to you. At the end of this passage, he says, But if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and worship other gods, we shall surely perish out of the good land whether we pass over. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river, but John Winthrop says vast sea. Why does he do that? 
So they didn't cross a river to get here. They crossed an ocean. So what's he implying? That he and the colonists are sitting at the banks of their promised land, about ready to go and take possession of it. On the model of Jesus and the exhortation of Jesus to be a city on a hill, and in the spirit of Old Testament Israel, they are here to take possession of their promised lands. Now, who here has read the book of Joshua? You don't have to read very far into the book of Joshua to realize that promised lands for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. And that's what happened. The sin of Israel in the book of Joshua was that they didn't kill everybody. And if you look at the U.S. history of what we did, our notion of promised lands literally resulted in God-ordained genocide, we thought, for native peoples and African peoples throughout this land. This led, this idea kind of percolated. This was, I call it, the birth of American exceptionalism. The idea percolated for about 100 years. The late um, 18th century, the late 1700s, we began expanding westward. As that was happening, the Second Great Awakening was taking place. There was this notion that uh, this rebirth of denominationalism and this religious fervor as our settlers were moving west. And then in the early 19th century, the 1840s, the term manifest destiny was coined. This belief that, as a nation, we have the right to rule this land from sea to shining sea. This implicit bias is so deeply founded in American history that last spring, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was in front of a joint session of our Congress lobbying against the Iran nuclear deal that was being negotiated. He wanted to speak to a very partisan, a very divided Congress and get them on the same page. So he chose to say to them, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny the destiny of promised lands. Now, does anyone really think that the Prime Minister of Israel believes you and I share with the covenant his people have with the God of Abraham? Or is he merely a very savvy politician who knows well the implicit bias of his audience? Who of you have heard of the Evangelical Immigration Table? This is a group that's working to get comprehensive and just immigration reform passed in our nation. When there was a bill on the table about two years ago, they came out with a bookmark that they said demonstrated God's heart for the alien or for the other. One of the verses they chose was Jeremiah 7, 5, 6, and 7. If you change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, all these are good exhortations. Obey them. But verse 7 says, Then I shall let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. I went to my friends on the evangelical immigration table. I said, you can't use this verse. You are not God's chosen people. This is not your promised land. The United States of America is not rich and powerful because of God's blessing. We're rich and powerful because we're systemically racist and inherently unjust. The American dream is predicated upon two things, an empty continent and free labor. Explorers got here and went back to Europe. We found an empty continent and we've imported a bunch of free labor. Come and find your opportunity. So the hope of America does not come from God's covenant with Israel. Our hope comes not from how God treated Israel. Our hope comes from how God treated the other pagan nations of the biblical narrative. Our hope comes from the fact that God, of his own free will, or that God was willing to negotiate with Abraham over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Our hope comes from the fact that God pulled Rahab out of Jericho before he destroyed the city. Our hope comes from the fact that God of his own free will said to Jonah, I want to have mercy on Nineveh, go and prophesy to them. Our hope does not come from a covenant with God. Our hope as a nation comes from the character of God. And that's a much more difficult thing to pin down. I love how C.S. Lewis describes it. Have you read the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? 
So the children are in Narnia. They've met the White Witch. It's always winter, never Christmas, never spring. They've met the beavers. They've lost their brother to the White Witch. They're traveling through this land. They're sitting at the home of the beavers, and they're hearing about this character, Aslan, who's apparently on the move and is going to make some changes. As they talk, it begins to dawn on them that Aslan might not be who they think he is. And so they begin asking questions. And Susan finally says, but excuse me, is Aslan a man? No, he's not a man, honey, says Mrs. Beaver. He's a lion. Oh my gosh, says Susan. I should be quite nervous about meeting a lion. Well, you should. If anyone can stand before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. Susan says, well, is he safe? No, he's not. He's a lion. But he's good. He's good. Confessing the sins of the church, confessing the sins of our nation, will not be safe. But our hope is that God is good. If as a child, you stole a bike, and you went to your parents and said, Mom, Dad, I stole this bike, would they let you keep it? (laughs) Confessing the sins of our nation will not be safe. The challenge we face as a church and as Christians is that we think we live in a Christian empire. We don't acknowledge that the church has prostituted itself out to the empire since Constantine. The idea of a Christian empire is completely extra-biblical. And even if there was an idea of a Christian empire, the United States of America definitely would not be it. The church has to divorce itself from the empire. We have to go into a season of lament so that we can begin working towards the healing that is so desperately needed within our land. There's a quote. I'm going to go a little past this. There's a quote by an Aboriginal leader named George Erasmus who says, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must first be created. This quote, I believe, gets to the heart of our problem with race in the United States. We have no common memory. We have a dominant culture that remembers the history of discovery, expansion, exceptionalism, and opportunity. And we have communities of color that have the lived experience of genocide, ethnic cleansing, slavery, Jim Crow laws, mass incarceration, internment camps, and there's no common memory. We need to find a way to have a national dialogue on race that begins to create this common memory. One of the things I'm advocating for, many nations have had what are called truth and reconciliation commissions. Reconciliation, racial reconciliation, in the United States of America is a complete misnomer. Reconciliation assumes a previous harmony in the relationship. When you look at race in America, there was no harmony. This thing started bad. We do a lot to perpetuate the myth as a nation. Thanksgiving is all about perpetuating the myth. Talking about discovery perpetuates the myth. Talking about a century of expansion perpetuates the myth. Talking about racial reconciliation perpetuates the myth. We don't need racial reconciliation. We need racial conciliation. Conciliation is defined as the mediation of a dispute. Reconciliation allows the myth to continue. Conciliation acknowledges the past for what it was, which is bad. So one of the things I'm working towards is trying to initiate a national dialogue on race, which I'm calling a Truth and Conciliation Commission in 2021. I'm traveling around the country, speaking, writing, blogging, trying to persuade our nation that we have to find a way to talk about race. I'll end on this last point, which is one of the things, when you look at this history, it's easy to see the historical trauma of Native and African American communities. But what I try to point out 
is that you cannot build a nation on 500 years of systemic racism, dehumanizing injustice, ethnic cleansing and genocide without traumatizing yourself. So I identify white America as another traumatized people group. One of the symptoms of trauma is denial. Our nation's in de deep denial. When you deal with trauma, you know that trauma victims have a trigger that brings them back into the chaos and the confusion of the point that the trauma happened. If you understand our nation as a traumatized people group, you can clearly see our triggers. Five years of a black president is a trigger. It sends us into the crazy. Any sort of national dialogue on gun control is a trigger. It sends us into the crazy. ISIS is a trigger. Why is ISIS a trigger? Well, they're a group of religious zealots ethnically cleansing a land to set up their own empire. That sounds a bit too familiar, doesn't it? That's why Paris gets bombed and it's all about us. We don't know what to do with that. We need to understand that not only are communities of color traumatized from this history, but white America is another traumatized people group. And we have to find a way to come up with a shared solution. A national dialogue on race leading towards truth and conciliation is what I'm advocating for. Thank you very much for letting me come today.